quick as we go. Please subscribe, like, and share. Morning, wherever you're at around this crazy world. I'm glad that you guys tuned in and thank you very much. Anyway, uh, a little feedback. Uh, I've been talking to a lot of you from all over and appreciate the positive uh, uh, comments and everything, especially from our service uh, personnel from the U.S. Armed Forces. Uh, I talk to a lot of you guys and appreciate your service and coming from a military family uh, you guys are close to my heart so thank you and uh, we'll try to help you guys with your projects hey Matt from Kentucky here's one for you buddy all right so uh, thanks for your service anyway today we will talk about uh, how to get the most power and efficiency at the same time you can have both okay but one main ingredient in horsepower and efficiency meaning with the price of gas today you try to go as far as you could you know on, on what are your whatever you're burning 91 93 or even 87 whatever you're burning I know it's expensive if you can go further you just pick the right parts building the engine uh, you're gonna enjoy your hot rod street car or or street bracket racer much much better okay so we start one thing we need to talk about in order to have efficiency is your engine size okay build the biggest engine you can build let's start with stroking the engine okay stroking means adding more uh, crankshaft stroke or a better a, a bigger crank either you buy it from SCAD or whoever else uh, when you have a, a Chevy let's say for example even a Ford they're roughly about 348 and three and a half in uh, stroke measurement you know when you see bore and stroke on a four inch bore okay your stroke is your cubic inch for example a small block Chevy has got a four inch bore with a 348 stroke, it's a 350. A 351 Ford has got a three and a half inch stroke and a four inch bore is 351. 302 Ford, three inch stroke, 440 over, 302 cubic inch. Similarly with the Z28 engine. Okay, that's roughly the same short stroke. Now, when you add a half an inch, let's say with a three and a half inch stroke, Ford or Chevrolet or three or four, let's just round off for the Chevy. Three and a half a stroke. You put 0.500, half an inch of stroke, that's 50 inches. 0 0.500 is 50 cubic inches. Same thing with the bore. 30 over is six inches. 40 over is eight inches. So remember that. With a four inch stroke on a 400 Chevrolet, with a 4125 bore, okay that's roughly about oh god 12 5 12 5 you know so you're looking at 427 inches same thing with a ford with a four stroke crank you put a uh, 4125 bore you got 427 inches now what you have to realize is that this bigger engines don't have to work as hard they're less well they're more resistant and less prone to detonation why is that first thing the size the cubic inches they don't have to work as hard they have so much leverage their stroke is wider this is a three inch stroke this is a four inch stroke okay now it's a lever arm but one uh, benefit of having a bigger stroke is the fact that a piston with a three inch stroke goes like this on top dead center it's a continuous motion because a short rod shorter stroke it has a continuous motion whereas a stroke over the four inch or 4250 it goes like this it stops stops okay it dwells at TDC a little bit longer than a typical short stroke 
version of that same engine. Now, referring to my old video about quench and the benefits of quench, when this engine, a long stroke motor, meaning a stroker engine, the piston sits at TDC several degrees more. Depends on the rod length and the stroke. If you have a longer rod with a longer stroke, it sits there a little bit longer. Now, when the spark kernel starts from the spark plug gap, it takes off like this, like a sphere, and starts to burn real fast, or a fast burn, and it must accelerate to an explosion. When it's, you hear, when it becomes an explosion inside the chamber, it goes at the speed of sound, and that ding, 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 you hear? That's the sound wave going from one side of the cylinder wall to the next. It's banging in there and bouncing to the other side. That's why you hear a ding, 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 ding. That is detonation. Now, if you hold that piston at TDC a little bit while longer, the quenched part of the chamber, which I explained in prior videos, and I suggest you guys look at it so you understand better, because I have to rehash this. It'll, it'll make this uh, video longer. The quench is held tighter by the piston sitting at TDC four to six degrees more. Okay? And what it does is that when it starts to accelerate or burn rapidly and wants to go to an explosion, it hits the quench and slows it down. Quench meaning tap it down. Okay? Or tapping it down. That is the benefit of a tight quench. A long stroke engine holds that even tighter still by the mere fact that it doesn't pull away from TDC and exposes the, the still unburned fuel and starts to lose the quench and accelerate to an explosion. Okay, So a long stroke motor will be resistant to detonation by the mere fact of the piston TDC. Now let's talk about quench. If you did not stroke the crank but you keep your piston to head clearance very very tight that also helps you suppress detonation and make more power why is that okay years ago there was a guy with a pretty fast Camaro and I'm watching him run I'm helping him out but I'm always wondering I go man how come he's running 38 degrees almost 40 sometimes on this car when he's got an aluminum head it's obviously some compression 11 and a half to one which is a street car it's a good running small block and so one day he decided to pull the heads off to freshen the, the valve job and make sure everything's seated and functioning correctly and he called me over and I go okay now let's see why he's got this uh, excellent excellent design Brodick cylinder head and it's pumping 40 degrees of total timing in this thing it doesn't make no sense so when I got there, I said, let me see your head gasket, and I pulled the head gasket, it was 55 thousandths thick. And I said, you're running this? Yeah, that's what uh, my friend told me to run, because I got a dome, and I'm trying to keep it away from the dome. I go, have you checked it with a clay? He goes, no, but he told me just to be safe. I go, well, it seems like you're losing a lot here. Your combustion chamber is ineffective on the sun, but I got a high swirl and so forth so on you know a good tumble according to the manufacturer I said yeah but that is if you have the right piston if you have the wrong piston it's not gonna function correctly because it's not gonna burn correctly anyway here we go so we talked about putting it down to 35 after I clayed the dome and everything it's so far away from the from the combustion chamber it's not even funny so I said take it down from 55 to 35 that's big and let's go back to the track but may I suggest that you back down the timing to about 34 okay 35 to start but I'm gonna lose power because before when I, I was at 40 or 38 I drop it down to to 35 because that's what I hear people say that this head is a uh, you know a, a, an efficient but I, I wasn't getting it and I said yeah what's your 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 uh, thickness, your, your quench was too wide. Anyway, so he did that. He went up, first pass. Almost two tenths faster than before with less timing. 
He's looking at me. My God, you're right. This one wouldn't have ran. It would have slowed down at 35. Now I'm two tenths, about two tenths. Okay? With no other changes. He goes, man, I, that's the, the best power I ever got without spending an arm and a leg. <laughs> go, there you go. So now he settled to like 30, 32. And then he was right there. The engine wasn't working as hard. And then when he drove home, he says, shush. He goes, coming home from a, a, tr a Thursday night run, I I'd have to uh, fill up to make it home. He goes, I made it on the same tank with the octane booster in it. I go, well, you're doing well. Okay, so he had an appreciation for the right quench clearance, and I suggest you guys do the same thing. Pay attention to the quench clearance. That's why Fel Pro has a 38,000 or 39,000 their performance head gasket uh, thickness because some of you guys have a piston 5, 10,000 below deck and Felpro made sure that their head gasket is at 39 or 38 to compensate to make sure you have good because you remember when you detonate it even compromises the head gasket seal all right because that's a spike in combustion pressure and heat that is no good now let's touch subject on another aspect aluminum or cast iron head I've had calls from guys with TFS high port heads. They go, hey, Ben, uh, I got a TFS high port head and uh, I'm going to switch to aluminum because I heard it's better. Well, if it was all equal, okay, and it flows the same, combustion is the same, and what was your compression ratio? You go 91. Okay, 302, right? It goes out 302. If you go with a TFS cast iron, Let's say it flows uh, 285, 290, and you go to an aluminum TFS high port with the same 285, 290 CFM, you will lose power. How come? It's aluminum. That's exactly it. It's aluminum. The thermal efficiency of aluminum is a lot less than cast iron. At 91, you have low heat content your thermal efficiency is not very good you don't have enough heat to have a big combustion kick all right your torque your tip in power heat is power you cannot have horsepower without heat the higher the compression the higher the horsepower because the heat dynamic uh, uh, efficiency is better with cast iron okay so now just like with that head gasket routine when we squished that it created a little bit more compression all right with the prior example i told you about the small block chevy with a thinner head gasket now but here you go at nine to one when you go with an aluminum head a thermal efficiency will take a nose dive because it runs too cool all right or cooler and you're not going to have the efficiency i go if weight isn't a factor for you as soon as you mash the pedal you can feel the torque the instantaneous response of the cast iron head as opposed to your aluminum head at nine to one let me give you an example like that guy went quicker by two tenths i have one customer before years ago he went to one of these dyno shoots where on the weekend they met like a Saturday or whatever and they all went to the dyno and his was a 306, 30 over 302. No, he's a, a 308. Now, what happened with him? Was he had a true 11 and a half to one on a cast iron GT40 three bar head, not the P. Okay? So, at the conclusion of the dyno pool, he said, oh, Ben, I'm mid-pack. I'm mid-pack. There's some guys out there, but for 308 or 302 stock stroke, I was making more power than anybody. I go, yeah, because you have a true 11 and a half to one, as opposed to everybody with 9 to 1 aluminum head. He goes, yeah, they were softer, but they peaked pretty good, close to where I'm at. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's not surprising because they have a bigger intake valve to your 194, they have a 202, or if they're running AFR or TFS, probably some are even bigger. Now, when they went to Fontana Drag Strip after that dyno day, uh, the whole group, or most of them, went up to the track, and when they started running, he wasn't even the slowest. He was mid-pack on a dyno pull, but he was one of the faster guys. Faster than any 302 stock motor. Almost as fast as some of the 347s. Why is that? The throw, 302s, he was the fastest. <laughs> on a GT40, some guys there were exhibiting or running aluminum heads. Aluminum GT40, AFRs, TFS twisted wedge, and uh, high port. They were running as fast as he was with a so-called inferior cylinder head. Why is that even uh, explainable? Because his thermal efficiency is where it's best. 11 and a half to 1. If you're using a compression ratio, it's between 1 point. If they're 9 to 1, he's at 11 and a half. 9, 10, 11 and a half. That's 2 and a half points. One point is between 35 to 45 horsepower, depending. Let's just say 40 per point. Four, eight, he's about 100 horsepower on top of those guys. Now you can see why. He goes, some of the other guys that I ran 347, he goes, I think they may have 9 to 1 stock, you know, uh, compression or low compression. Some of the other, he goes, a handful were really strong. Yeah, I go, they probably have a flat top. They're pumping 10.5, 10.3. He goes, yep, but they, didn't, they weren't that far away from me. I was right there with him. So he says, everybody's looking at his combination. Why is he so fast? He's faster than most of the stock stroke and very, very close to some of the aluminum headed guys and faster than some of the 347 guys. Again. If you have a 347, you're 9 to 1 with aluminum heads, you are not doing yourself a favor. Okay? You will be behind quite a bit power wise. You may have the airflow, okay, but he was exhibiting stronger 60 foot. He would pull away and then they'll inch because they have a better uh, airflow or more airflow. Now, if, like I said, it was all equal, that cast iron head would produce power. But now, if you have 11 to 1 or 10.5, for example, for the 347s or, or even 383 Chevys out there, I see the pistons are like 9 to 1. Wow, what a waste of time. But I'm just giving you guys uh, a sound advice, okay, from experience. I'm not racing no dynos. I'm not racing no flow benches here. I'm giving you experience at the track. Sometimes a dyno, even here on the flow bench, it may show better on an airflow, but not necessarily at the track. I get on the dyno when you see, oh, I'm I'm stronger by eight or ten horsepower than you at peak. Okay, perhaps it makes you feel better, but when you actually run at the track, I'm seeing differences of eight to ten horsepower go upside down at the racetrack okay what is your broad power brand does it hit stronger on the lower end of the scale or the rpm spectrum if you have heat in your engine meaning compression you're gonna be hard to beat but now if you have a 383 347 11 to 1 10 and a half minimum 11 and a half boy you will be good now on a street let me advise you guys when people say Oh, I can't put too much compression and I can't put, put too much camshaft because I'll detonate. Well, sometimes your caution is your downfall. When you try to build an 11 to 1 motor and you're afraid of detonation and you put a smaller camshaft, smaller than usual, you're going backwards. Okay? Compression has a way of soaking dynamic well, no, 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 no. Camshaft duration, and also where you play your lobe, se lobe separation, has a way of dampening 
the dynamic compression, the actual working compression of the engine. That is very important to know. Okay, so when you have 10 and a half to one, let's say, because you don't want to go to 11 and a half or 11, because you're afraid of detonation, then you put also a small camshaft. You're going backwards. When you put high compression pistons, let's say 11 and a half to one, and a healthy, good, thumpy camshaft, guess what? You're headed the right direction. They complement each other. Take note, when you have an 11 to 1 with a, okay, no, no, let's, let's go back. You have 9 to 1 or 9 and a half to 1, 383 or 347 or 351, whatever, 400. Let's say your cranking, cranking compression is, let's say, 170 on all engines, okay? On those ones I gave you. For example, with a mild cam, it's 170. Now you put your big dumper camshaft that your buddy told you work real great on his car whatever great means so let's just say it's a 224 at 50 or 220 now you put a 235 240 guess what happens when you you go back out and you go man you know what it's got top end but it seemed like it's only up towards the end I lost so much low end mid range but it pulls good okay I agree but what actually happened here? Let's say you had your 220, 224 street cam and you put this mild OL, this semi-serious uh, uh, thump camshaft with 235. Do, your, do yourself a favor. Do a compression check. Before you're at 170, okay? After four hits on the needle, now you're probably 155. You've lost power. You gain power because of airflow, because of the bigger cylinder head and all that. But your dynamic compression took a nose dive. The cam is hanging a little bit longer because of the more duration. There's more overlap. And now the intake valve is closing late. Your dynamic compression took a dive, an indication of lower compression cranking pressure. Now, when you build an 11 and a half to one, with that same mild camshaft, you'll probably get close to 200 or maybe beyond. Okay, it depends. Let's just say 220 or 11 and a half to one. Or let's make it even 218, 219 with 11 and a half to one. You put that doggone uh, mild camshaft. When you crank after four or five hits, you may be at 200 or 205, perhaps even as high as 210. You know what that means? I've for years said to people when I advise them, your cranking pressure must not exceed 200 pounds for your pump gas motor. That's a threshold that I notice. Let's take into account your valve uh, closing uh, uh, timing, okay, and your compression ratio. So a 218, 219 camshaft at 50 with 11 and a half to one, 200 let's say, say or 205. You may detonate already, especially if the car is heavier. Now, you take that same 11 and a half to one, now you put a 228 or maybe 232, 235. You put that in, the same engine now, okay? That was pumping 200 pounds or 210 on the cranking pressure. Now you put the big camshaft. Take note of what just happened. Now you're looking at 180, 185. What happened? Your cranking pressure dropped. Duration has a way of soaking compression pressure. Lower. Now you will not detonate with a bigger camshaft. Now if you have a good cam grinder in there, I've worked with ISKI, CompCam, American Cam, they can vary that lobe separation. They can even make that to your advantage. All right, so take note of that. The smaller the camshaft, a medium compression might detonate. The bigger camshaft and the bigger compression might just be right. Avoid medium compression and small camshaft for your street build, okay? Remember, 
the, ca the, the little one on the wilder side camp chef is your friend. That's your buddy when you're trying to build a, a, a good, uh, straight, strong motor. Now, you also know, of course, the bigger camp chef will suck up more gas. But it still would be better with, when you pay attention to your quench and your the way your piston comes up to the head and everything. Oh, how do you know when you have the proper quench? Pull your spark plug out after you're running hard on the track. Go in there with a bore scope and look in there. If you see the shape of your combustion chamber on the top of that piston, you are good. Okay? With the spark, if it shadows the piston, you're as close as you're going to get. You don't want any contact. Okay? On my engines, and I will show uh, uh, a picture of what I'm talking about. Here it is. Okay, the piston, the combustion chamber is shadowing the piston. And you can see the imprint of the way they go. And I ask Ross or whoever your piston manufacturer is, please profile the combustion chamber so I can utilize my quench and my head gasket to be effective. Again, check my other videos on how this is supposed to function. How that quench pushes everything towards the center, towards the spark plug, and all the rich and, and lean uh, areas of the spark plug is blasted away and the air fuel mixture is more uniformly or better dispersed around the chamber and gives it a good spark. Okay, so what else do we got? Oh, okay. Uh, hydraulic or flat tappet camshaft. I would suggest you run a hydraulic roller cam. Avoid the flat tappet deal, especially for new builds. The oil that they are too thin, they don't have that much zinc. You can put a zinc additive or whatever. It's still a roller cam under the curve. And this picture shows you. And it shows you how on that lobe, it's got a broader lift range across. It may peak at 500 or 550 on your, on your street camshaft, but from the initial opening to the closing, it opens it up earlier and closes it up later. That is breathing. That's a breathing window. A roller cam, hydraulic roller does that. In fact, I have run solid roller on the streets. Comp cam, if you can specify a softer ramp, they can give that to you. Same thing with ISKI. All right. Now, uh, let's now let's go to another aspect. Oh. When do you need an aftermarket block? Not that long ago, like I said previously, I saw one guy, he wanted to build a 450 horsepower engine and he went to a uh, aftermarket block and I said, why? At 450, the factory 5.0 is, is capable of doing that. Now you added 50, 60 pounds on the nose and you think you're going faster. How can it? Well, now you, got, you strap your engine or your, the front of your car with a heavier weight. Didn't help you any, all right? And then another incident was somebody bought a aftermarket block and put a cast crank. <laughs> it's like building a uh, uh, Nipah hut made out of coconut leaves or whatever. <laughs> and then putting a steel billet door on there and the storm comes in, blows the roof and everything else while your door is still standing. Why? <laughs> Everything's gone, all right? So, same thing, okay? Uh, just don't go buy the parts because, well, maybe if you have a thick wallet, sure, and bragging rights, but it don't make any sense. You got an aftermarket block, nine to one piston, cast crank. Does that even make sense? And some guy over here, you know, on the other block, has got a factory block with 11 and a half to one, Okay, cast iron head to your aluminum. All right, not stroke. He's gonna clean your clock. Seen it happen. One time, we're at we're, oh, for, uh, Pomona Street Drags. Hector DeSano, one of my old customers. He had a 306 with a dart cast iron head. Everybody laughed at his heads. 
because his flow was only like 285, 290. Not very impressive. They're bragging, oh, man, 315, 320. Ah, we're, we're good, you know, we got more airflow. You know, we got aluminum heads, and he was like, okay, whatever, you know. He's got like 11 to 1. Cast iron dart head. Well, we, we, had, we just cut the heads, milled it, you know, flat top. Uh, by the time, I think he's got like in the low 55 cc chambers and stuff. And all these guys are squeezing, you know, low 10, bragging about their cars. So Hector shows up with his cast iron headed 306, went up to the line and cut a 930 on the first pass. Everybody's shocked. Everybody was laughing at his 285 CFM cylinder head. What happened? They're all squeezing, mind you. Okay? So, <laughs> the dad was so happy, he said, he said, well, uh, we're going home now. We didn't hit the tens. We ran straight to the nines. Our job is done. <laughs> he goes, we didn't even, I'm disappointed. We didn't even hit the tens, but we ran right into the low nines. And that was uh, a very, very revealing, uh, should I say, example, okay? His combination was so efficient. He was squeezing as much as everybody else. Well, like 175, 150, un non-adjustable plate from NOS. So there you go. Uh, just um, take note of that proper combination. He had a solid roller street cam. You know, six, 640 lift, some of that on nitrous. Oh man, that sounds like a ram. Anyway, what else do we, okay. Ignition timing. This is taking longer than next one, but you might have to split this into two sections. Ignition timing. Ma a lot of people make this mistake. When they put an aftermarket camshaft in there, they look at the factory specs on the manual. Oh, um, this 302 or the 351 or the Chevy called for six degrees. So guess what they do? They put six degrees on their crank because that's what the factory said. But you're not running the factory cam anymore. More so if you get higher compression. You need to kick up the ignition timing above. In fact, excuse me, when you run a stock motor, 5.0 calls for 10 degrees initial timing with a spot disconnected. Sometimes they come from the factory at 6 degrees and 8 degrees. And eventually, some make it with 10 degrees. That's great. Go in here and just put 4 degrees. Sit at a 14 degrees especially live here in Vegas or Palmdale. Right of the bat, 14 degrees initial timing instead of 10 what the factory calls for. You pick up power. Check that at the track. You will see that and you will experience that. I went quicker at 14 degrees instead of the factory. Sure. Okay, you're cranking more lead time in there. Okay, now when you have an aftermarket cam Disconnect the vacuum line from the carb to the vacuum canister on the distributor. Because with the stronger vacuum signal, it overwhelms the vacuum canister and pulls it and throws a lot more than before uh, vacuum advance into your distributor. Then you start detonating. So when you have an aftermarket cam, okay? Or you mill the heads, put a thinner head gasket, take the vacuum uh, canister off the hose, just plug it up on both sides, just run full mechanical. Now, if you have this hot dog street engine, now with a full mechanical distributor, be it a modified uh, factory distributor or an MSD, anything short of locking it down, okay, with with a non-adjustable or no centrifugal advanced distributor. If you do uh, MSD, avoid putting two of the white springs or two of the yellow springs. The reason being, when that thing is turning at high RPM, the engine has a lot of vibration, all right? A lot of things going on there. When you have the weight start to spread and you have two yellow springs, there is a possibility that they will vibrate at the same time. 
Okay? When they do, you watch your ignition timing, your dampener starts bouncing up. Oh, it's my timing chain. No, it was your distributor weight gyrating because the spring are losing control. Okay? They're oscillating. How can you fix that? Either you put the yellow spring on one side and the white spring. Or the white spring and then the silver. Depends on your requirements. But most cars, you want it to be at 2500 RPM all in, the advanced. Or if you guys got 430s, 410 with a low gear converter, you could probably bring it even closer to uh, about 2000 RPM. Everything in. That regards a lighter spring, it's more susceptible to vibration. So what, when you run a silver spring and a very light white spring, that cancels the vibration, the oscillation on the timing, okay? One is a little harder or stiffer than the other one, they tend to cancel out. Okay, so yellow and silver, but never silver and silver or yellow and yellow. You try to avoid that they usually bounce okay what else do we have All right. oh uh, carburetors ha ah, that's another hard one if you have the right part okay uh, a small block nine to one I would prefer 650 302 even some 347 only when you have higher compression a big camshaft then I would say run a 700 750 double pumper but if you have a street car 650 double pumper is good or if you want for a milder or more um, mileage conscious drivers out there run a 750 double pump I mean a vacuum secondary not double pumper like a 3310 3310 series it's got a vacuum secondary. Now, some have a 780, 3310. The difference is that's a straight leg booster, and then the 780 old school one, 33 dash one, I think, or even, I think they're up to dash four, dash three. The down leg booster goes like this, okay? And there's the booster. It picks up another 30 CFM. If you can find a lot of these old 3310, freshen them up, and that's a little bit better than the 750. Because if you can flow more without making the Venturi and the throttle plate any more bigger, it's a gain. All right, like they say, more flow into a smaller hole, you're going to gain power. Okay, now, for you serious street guys, especially the guys running nitrous or whatever, if you ended up with your 11 and a half to 1 or 12 and a half to 1, 13 to 1 street motor, I tend to gravitate towards an 850, 750, or whichever one. Okay? Even a 1050 Dominator on a street car. My street car back in 1990 was going 1030 on a muffler. No nitrous. I had a 4172 stroke, 60 over, and that thing with a stock 400 m crank cut down i went as fast as 1027 and i was looking at the oil pressure was starting to shake around i knew that crank was about to go now i can build the same engine combination with a scat or whatever eel crank you know the the budget cranks out there i go 970 with the same basic combination okay that was a 400 m cut down Ooh, that was scary all right but why an annular discharge the annular discharge Venturi not only disperses the fuel into a better optimized state, but every time you do a gear change when the RPM drops, that Venturi being more effective and more precise tend to run a little richer on the lower RPM. When the RPM drops, they tend to save your engine, especially if you're on nitrous or on the verge of detonation. Annular discharge tendency is to run a little bit richer on the mid-range part as opposed to the conventional booster okay you can see the annual discharge because like on a dominator it's, it's got a pretty big uh, venturi in there you see a lot of fine little holes around it 
okay? So, uh, every time I have a street engine, uh, a healthy 750 horsepower, 650 running on the street, some of these guys are that crazy, even 800, uh, they have a Dominator, I take that off and I switch to an engine or discharge Venturi. And I read my plug, I, I, I like what I see better. Okay, because every time you put a gear change, that's when it wants to detonate as well as high RPM. Now, when you do a gear change, it drops the RPM, there's more time that the air can get in because let's say at 4,500 or 5,500 RPM, there's more open time that the valve is open and since the RPM is low, lower, there's more time to ingest more fuel and the especially the best torque is when it gets the, the most amount of uh, air and fuel charge. When your peak torque is high, let's say at 4,400 or 4,800, that's when it has a tendency to detonate. And if you're a tad richer because of the annular discharge or either jetting even with conventional, it'll save you. Okay? But why does it detonate at high RPM? Because when you hit, hit best torque, it fills up the cylinder to within past 100% volumetric efficiency. Sometimes it gets beyond that, 110 and 115, depends on your runners and everything. And that's when you have a tendency to, to overfill the cylinder, past the limit of your pressure compression ratio and the cam timing that's, that you're using. And you will possibly, possibly detonate. But why does it detonate at high RPM? Now, you have, why will it detonate when you have less time to ingest all these? You have an air fast coming uh, column of air meets a shut off val uh, a valve that's shut they pile up as soon as the next uh, next time the valve opens up then they all rush in okay that, that is part of the dynamics of the intake port the port recovery it stacks them all on top of the closing thing valve. as soon as the wave the second wave they stack up the second wave starts coming back and the intake valve opens up it's an artificial turbocharging Okay? That's why you have all these long runners and so forth and so on. That's what they're trying to reutilize. But back to the subject. Why did it detonate? Because now at high RPM, your ignition, ignition, ignition is one constant cycle after the other. The combustion chamber will tend to overheat at high RPM. Because it's more, let's say at 3000 RPM, now you're at 6000 RPM. You have twice the amount of ignition pulses. Of course, you're going to create more heat inside the combustion chamber. That's why sometimes it wants to detonate, not at full maximum torque range, but at high RPM, because the combustion chamber start to overheat. Temperature for your streetcar. A lot of guys I still, I still see until today, they run 160 thermostat. Absolutely not the way to go. Run 180 on your streetcar. I've seen more worn out engines because of these. All right? You can build it. You can build it really by the best machine shop out there, but if you run it cold, I don't care. It's going to wear out. The bore is going to get worn out. The ring is going to get, you know, <laughs> old real quick. Now, 180, 185, that is where the oil functions the best. That's what they design it for. Not at 160, not at 140. 185 plus in fact some of 215 or 200 but I like that number 185 now I have opened up fuel injected 5.0s and Chevy's TPI or whatever this guy's got 150 180,000 miles the bore where is good sometimes you just light hone it put new rings boom out they go again granted that they are consistent with their oil changes and their maintenance old school cars with choke carburetors choke that's the worst thing you fire up hardly any oil it's cold and you're dumping that raw fuel with a choke plate close it's going full rich and the rpm is up there's a more more wear happens at this phase if you fire up an engine never shut it down it may never wear out it's a cycle of cold start then to heat okay uh, i see Hot rod engines, street engines with cold thermostat, 80, 60,000 miles, you get a lip on top of the bore because it's too cold. Okay? The oil isn't doing its best job and the rings are going up and down, not getting the protection that they need. 
soon enough your wear is done your engines worn out so run a hotter thermostat years ago I had a bunch of blocks sitting on the backyard you know old timers our castings weren't as good not like they have today from dart or from what the other manufacturers aftermarket we used to sit our blocks on, on the sun out there and get beat up in the hot summer heat and, and get cold whatever they call it weatherizing the block and that's been widely practiced back in the day that said i had one block among a pile of them and this was a 340 chrysler and I noticed, I go, wow, the, the Chevy, the Fords, they're rusting um, pretty good, you know what I mean? And I look at this block and I'm thinking, why is this a very, it's not even rusting as bad as the Chevy and the Fords. And in fact, the other Chrysler blocks that I had. Anyway, come to think of it, I took it out and I cleaned it up just to look at it and i forgot all about it it's got four bolt main uh actually they were billet caps and i don't think that was a factor but it was a four bolt main block and when i cleaned it up and i look at the serial number it had t slash a lo and behold to my surprise it was a transam block a three four transam block i was shocked eventually i sold that to a, a rear end shop out there in the city of industry and they were after that so bad because they ran uh, small block Chryslers and they gave me a nice uh, nine inch Ford Continental, Continental housing for my Mach 1 which had the bigger uh, housing tubes and everything and a lot sturdier and I go okay you guys can use this better than I can so I gave the I traded that for the for the nine inch uh, Lincoln Continental housing nine inch Ford so uh, how do we know this parts just like that tip off to me was it wasn't rusting as much as the other ones and it was on the same location in the back back of my garage here's a way to tell how how what part you're looking at especially crank and and uh, blocks what are you really looking for this is what you're looking for follow up okay here's a quick test to see if you have a good crank. The one on the right, of course, is a cheap, uh, not, sh I shouldn't say lower quality, but the Ford cranks are, from the factory, are pretty doggone good. All right, they can take a lot of power, they can take a lot of punishment and make a lot of power without breaking. And the one over here is a scap, forging. Now, how do you test these things? If, let's say, this tool had been sitting in your garage, or your buddy's garage he's got a bunch of cranks you line them up and do this test okay the stock one it's obvious it's rusted the forging will never rust as mu mu much as that one there all right under the same circumstances but here's a quick test here's the sound that a stock crankshaft will emit when you tap it here's the sound of a forging aftermarket Okay, that's a quick way, just like washing the block and see who rusts first, that'll tell you which part you should run. So if these things are all oxidized or rusted and you tap this and you go, wow, wow, and this one, get rid of that. Okay guys, a quick tick. Now, what you saw there is that when you have two cranks sitting on the side again it's not rusting as quickly as the other ones like i showed here tap it wait for the ringing sound if it's got a dead boom get rid of it or don't use that use the one with a really nice tinning sound ding ding okay like a symbol that uh, tells you it's a very good uh, steel perhaps lots of carbon in it all right and same thing with the block when you wash both of them and let it sit don't even blow dry let it sit the one that rusts first is the weaker block same thing that's a quick quick way of finding out what you have again just like the transom block it wasn't rusting as much as the other ones so that was a tip off for me just like this crank test anyway i hope 
this helps you guys and I'll keep coming back to um, more and more of these uh, tips while I go through I cannot give everything at one time it'll probably take two or three hours and I hope uh, this helps you out in your projects and give you a better direction something to think about therefore please uh, like subscribe and share Ben Alameda Racing here on YouTube and thank you very much take care